Goedag and welcome from Amsterdam. Thanks for tuning in on this Forward 2021 session, which will be a talk show, a conversation on congested ports, on unprecedented stress on supply chains around the world, on how this situation evolved, what got us here, and what we can look out for in 2022 and the years to come. My name is Johannes Berg. I'm the Managing Director of the Digital Hub Logistics in Hamburg. And to be honest, my expertise and experience in global supply chains and trade is rather limited. That's why I go heavyweight with my guests today, uh, which bring a combined over seven decades of professional expertise and experience in freight forwarding in the analysis of global supply chains to the table. And therefore, I hope that this hour will be worth your while watching. And I'm very happy to start introducing my guest, uh, Gert-Jan Rulands. You are Senior Vice President at KLM uh, at Air France, KLM Martin Air Cargo. And Gert-Jan, uh, based in Amsterdam, you're, so to say, uh, one of the locals here. You told me earlier that uh, over the last years, you also struggled not only uh, with your professional logistics experience to, to keep things up to market, but also on the private side, having a few kids uh, going through homeschooling while working must have been a challenge. Good that you're with us. Uh, welcome to this conversation. Stefan. Uh, general Manager of Flexport in Germany. Uh, to put things straight right at the beginning, no kickboxing here. I know that you're a, you're a, a fascinated kickboxer uh, by training. Uh, by training, you're also uh, a traditional blue chip forwarder, so to say, but, but your passion uh, besides your kids and, and uh, your hobbies lies into also exploring how digital technology can, uh, can make um, a trade and supply chain activities uh, not only more efficient, but you told me also more sustainable. That's a topic at your heart. Florian, good morning uh, to you as well, uh, head of Ocean Freight EMEA at Flexport. Uh, you bought a house uh, from 1900, uh, which is a logistical challenge uh, to renovate and bring up to speed. Besides having three kids, uh, all going through homeschooling uh, and daycare in Corona times as well. So uh, good that you could make it. Uh, happy to have you with me. And uh, uh, Paul Rombeck, Senior Director, I have to read that, Network Trade Lane Management, EMEA at Flexport. Uh, you had probably the most exciting story to tell me up front. You moved back to the Netherlands after being 20 years abroad. And uh, not only did the container arrive a bit late, surprise in these times, um, but uh, your cargo got mixed up, so you lived in, in mixed furniture after moving back to your home country. Um, so uh, I hope that is going to settle in the next few months or weeks. Uh, good to have you with us as well. So I stick to this side to start with, uh, gentlemen. There isn't a day really where you open the news and uh, uh, news coming in about the situation getting worse. Uh, factories in China uh, switching off the electricity. Uh, stock is at all time low levels, congestion, not only uh, in US ports, but also in airports. What got us here really? How, how did this situation evolve? Florian, maybe to start with you. Well, the situation, uh, I would say, in, evolved with the, with the outbreak of, of, of COVID in China, um, when, when first time a, a factory started to close. Um, and then um, that, that, that shutdown of China was followed by, by, by a lockdown in the, in the Western economies. And in, in consequence, there was uh, hardly any freight to be shipped. Huh? So there was kind of a, a, a demand shock in, in, in that time. So ocean carriers uh, um, had to take out capacity, which they did about 70 percent, uh, uh, partly over several weeks. That means like 200,000 TUs less uh, um, 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 departing from China uh, into, into Europe and, and into the US. And then um, um, all of a sudden, basically, demand came back very strongly. So all the money that didn't go into, into services and, 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 and travel, people started to purchase goods, a lot of goods, like washing machines, uh, uh, fitness machines, uh, garden furniture, um, you name it, basically. So in the US, there was a, a, a very strong uh, um, demand spike. 
And that led basically to the fact that the tsunami of freight uh, uh, arrived, especially in LA, which then congested the port. Huh? Um, that led to the fact that, that, that freight rates really exploded into the US, and um, at some point, then European importers had to compete with uh, uh, American uh, importers for capacity and empty equipment. That led basically to a spillover effect on different trades, and overall we were suddenly looking at very, very high freight rates. Um, then when the situation started to cool down a little bit or, or started to normalize somehow uh, in it going to the right direction, the infamous ever given uh, uh, got stuck in the, in the Suez Canal for, for, for a whole week, which meant basically uh, um, um, that no ships could pass. Uh, all the ships that go to Europe had to pass the, the, the Suez Canal and about 300,000 TUs were stuck on the ocean for, for a full week. And then some decided to, to, to sail around the Cape, others went through the canal, but overall they roughly arrived at the same time. Yeah? So, so, so an armada of container ships uh, were hitting European ports, which then also congested European ports. Um, then that was followed basically by two further uh, COVID outbreaks in China, like uh, the, the port of Yantian, which is the biggest port in China, was closed for, for almost two weeks. Then there was another outbreak in, in Ningbo. So Ningbo port was also closed for, for more than a week or some terminals, and that led to congestion in, in, in Asia. So in the end now, we're looking at, at heavily congested ports in, in the US, in Europe, and in Asia. And that is causing currently the unstable supply chain, heavy delays, unreliabilities, and, and also high prices. Mm. Paul, so if I understand Florian right, there wasn't only one event. Uh, we can't blame mm. it on COVID altogether. Uh, you have anything to add on, on, on your colleagues' uh, statements? Yeah, no, I think uh, Florian is absolutely right. It, uh, th th there are certain triggers to, to this event. I, I think there's no one fault or one event that we could um, uh, allocate all the, all the blame to. Uh, because there are also, in my view, some structural uh, inputs eh, to, to, to the current situation. And if you look at the demand side, um, e-commerce um, is triggered by the events, uh, absolutely. But e-commerce has been already surging uh, uh, prior, prior to COVID. Eh? So currently, it's about 14% of total uh, uh, freight, air freight, and growing massively 30% year on year. Uh, and and that so the demand side driver uh, was already there. On the supply side, uh, as Florian rightly said, uh, there has been uh, constraints on the ocean side, which has triggered um, uh, also uh, supply issues on the on the air side. Uh, so about 30% of uh, total air freight capacity is belly capacity, and uh, and that has uh, seen a big drop, obviously. And today it's still around 20% below 2019 levels. So that structural uh, inputs to, to the current situation uh, is, is, is a big cause for the current situation, where we are heavily constrained, seeing high prices, everybody is uh, scrambling for capacity, and, uh, and companies have issues to manage their supply chains. Gert Jan, that calls for a, for a follow-up from you, uh, talking about empty bellies in, in planes, or, or even planes not even taking off. Uh, I said earlier in my introduction that we have almost uh, seven decades of, of combined experience in the industry here on these nice sofas. Have you ever experienced a situation like this before, f looking into the, the air cargo side of things? No, so I think, uh, as already said, I think this has been really unprecedented, uh, what we have been seeing. So, uh, also for us as uh, Air France KLM, but also for all other carriers, I would say, uh, worldwide, we have seen, as from the third week of uh, March, uh, basically a collapse of our network. Eh? So, so basically 80% of our capacity of our aircraft was on the ground, eh? except for the full freighter fleet uh, which we have. Um, yeah, and that, uh, then you move into a kind of contingency mode where you need to see, okay, how can we get supply chains uh, move again? And, uh, uh, and they're super important to uh, be very close with your customers to see basically how the most critical, uh, I would say, shipments can be moved. And in the first instance, that was really about making sure that all the relevant equipment for the crisis, so that means uh, face mask, PPE material, um, uh, medical equipment, stuff like that, uh, were shipped. And then you also see that how globalized we are. And it's all being produced in, in, in China. Uh, so we also had to start an air bridge between uh, Amsterdam, uh, China and, uh, and uh, mainly Shanghai and, uh, and Paris and uh, Shanghai and, uh, and Amsterdam. 
making sure that uh, yeah that all the equipment uh, was uh, was there. After that, we also saw how basically critical air freight is to the economy. Yeah, so we have uh, in the Netherlands, but also in France, we have certain businesses like the flower business, like uh, mm -hmm. the, the fruit and vegetable business, which are completely dependent on uh, on export. Um, uh, and to a large extent international. Uh, and also there, together with our customers, we have been seeing okay, what kind of network did we have to rebuild uh, with both our passenger flights, eh, where we uh, used the, the, the belly capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, for specifically for, for, for China, also uh, we used uh, a cargo in cabin, eh, so we also used the seats. We, we, we yeah, started innovation to see could we create uh, 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 bags to, to put on those seats, to put uh, boxes in. Um, we used uh, a new kind of concepts like uh, a Kickstarter to really say, okay, we, we have passenger aircrafts, but there is a lot of customers who cannot pay a full charter. Can we go to a kind of co-creation uh, concept? Uh, now, nah. uh, all those kind of things. Uh, also, uh, uh, in the end, we, we, we were able to, to fly I think in about uh, five, six months, basically all our wide body aircrafts, uh, our full freighter fleet, uh, and, and specifically focused on, uh, on cargo. Mm -hmm. And so uh, from one moment where you're ma mainly a passenger driven airline, suddenly you're a cargo driven airline. And that is of course quite a change. I must say, if you look, uh, and that, that I think has been quite critical, if you look uh, 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 yeah, basically to the focus in the company of cargo, that's quite essential uh, in order to make such a turnaround. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I think uh, within Air France KLM, there's cargo is really there. It's, it's on the on, on, on it's 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 a key topic in the boardroom, and that also made it possible really to uh, to shift to uh, to to this uh, this situation and to deal with this mm -hmm. and to be, to deliver the best product for our customers. Well, that uh, point towards adaptability and flexibility is, is surely something we're going to touch up on later on in this conversation. But uh, Stefan, coming to you, uh, you've been around in the industry, as I said earlier, a few years as well. You've been there in 2009 when the world experienced a, a little bit of a recession last time. You've been around in 2012 uh, during the European death crisis. Um, is there anything that brings back memories uh, looking at the time right now uh, compared to, to those years mentioned? Or is it really unprecedented what we see right now? So the freight forwarding industry um, was always, is always exposed to GDP fluctuations, right? That, that's what we saw in 2009 and also in 2012. What's maybe a little bit different is that during that period, um, we had um, capacity almost... Um, relatively stable compared to, to the demand, or we had also overcapacity in place. So when we look at the, at the pandemic, we had, um, you know, when we, when we look at Q2 2020, for instance, exports were down globally, minus 13% plus, um, minus 11% was imports. So at the same time, there was on the freight side, as we just heard, capacity was you know, reduced significantly on one side and the, on the ocean freight side, um, it was heavily congested. And that was a situation that really led to um, a lot of inefficiencies in our industry. To give you an example, we have, um, you know, still have a situation where we takes three times more the effort to move a shipment on one side. On the other side, um, freight forwarding and you know, logistics expertise is, is um, very, very much needed um, to accommodate all the reroutings, all the um, you know, bottlenecks that we have to overcome those, finding the right transport mode, right? We today not only discuss on the transport mode side, is it air freight, is it ocean freight, is it um, air sea, is it rail, is it how can we, how can we get the cargo moving? That's one thing. And the third point I would like to make is that the trust and collaboration between all involved parties, so the shippers, the suppliers, the customers, um, was definitely um, needed to increase. Um, so old um, procurement habits didn't work anymore. So it was more, let's work together and let's get things um, moving. Gentlemen, I think this was a very uh, good status quo description by the four of you, but let's try to, to bring out the crystal ball here. 
because I think we can all read upon uh, the situation in different parts of the world, but how is this situation really going to develop? How are we uh, looking at things in, in 12 months from now? Uh, Florian, uh, with what you've seen uh, over the, the last two years, what is your stake? Where will we be in, in 12 months? Still chaos, still congestion, still stressed supply chains to the limit, or is the situation slightly getting better? Yeah, it's it's uh, um, at this point in time it's 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 really hard to predict. But uh, uh, based on the, on the on the parameters that we are that we are seeing, there is no um, a sign of immediate relief uh, to the situation because um, the congestion of of of, of ports uh, um, continues. Um, um, the congested port leads to delays. Uh, delays lead to then uh, to, to to further congestion because uh, of the sudden uh, volume of freight arriving at at, at ports. And um, additionally, you, you you still see very strong demand, especially in the in the U.S. and and that is also affecting other other trades. Um, so it's 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 pretty hard to to say that there's going to be um, how this will develop. But I think we need to see um, Chinese New Year and how demand will come back after after Chinese New Year. I think that's pretty decisive. Um, something to watch is the electricity situation in, 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 in China, like with the power cuts that has happened before, but it's on a, on a, it seems to be a bit on a different scale. We don't see it yet in the data, so um, in the, the cargo ready dates and the volume that, 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 that the, the output seems to remain stable, but if elect electricity, so to say, will play a, a role for several months, that could cause also some um, a, a, another supply shock, yeah? so there's just less goods to be shipped, that in consequence could lead to um, 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 ports, uh, less cargo arriving at ports, and then a congestion would, would be resolved. But it's, it's pretty hard to say. At the moment, it looks like it's going to um, remain like that for, the, for, for, for 2022, which to me means like visibility uh, is, is, is a key aspect that we, visibility of where's, where is my purchase order, where are my goods, uh, how does the schedule change affect uh, um, um, the, my supply chain is, is very important at this point in time. Yeah? That's the ocean side of things. Uh, airports seem to be uh, getting a little bit more crowded these days again. How, how is the situation with, with Air France KLM uh, cargo looking in the next 12 yeah, months? Yeah, so I think for, from indeed from a uh, supply perspective, I think uh, things start to step-by-step step change. It differs a bit per region. Eh? If you look uh, to, to Asia, we still see a lot of uh, restrictions in place. Um, um, also South America, a bit the same. So, uh, and, 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 and Africa to a lesser extent, where we really expect the changes on the US, eh? the, the, where, where as from the second week of November, there will be again travel possible for passengers. And uh, yeah, and that for sure will lead to additional capacity step-by-step. Eh? Step. So we already see that now in uh, loaded in, in, in the systems. Uh, Uh, we also, uh, as Air France KLM, uh, added a lot of uh, capacity, at least uh, towards next year, uh, where basically as Air France, we will be uh, moving back specifically for the US uh, to levels even towards uh, 2019. Um, and uh, for KLM, uh, well, almost uh, at, uh, at par. Um, Uh, however, yeah, uh, then on the demand side, every, yeah, on the ocean side, there, there, there is a, a big struggle. I think there, there, there is huge demand still in the marketplace. We expect for the end of this year, at least, that uh, the demand will be in place as, uh, as we see it today, probably even, uh, even stronger. Uh, and then towards quarter one, uh, also we will expect uh, quite a big of, uh, part of overflow. Um, we expect a kind of first steps of normalization towards Q2, Q Q Q3, especially towards summer, where traditionally you have more capacity uh, in, uh, in the marketplace. But again, in this world, uh, you know, uh, every week we basically have a uh, different picture, so it's indeed quite hard to predict. But um, I think step by step we will move to a kind of normalization. Mm. Paul, I don't think... To be honest, that your forgotten furniture will show up in the next 12 months. <laughs> But uh, what's your stake on, on the situation uh, looking forward uh, the year ahead? Yeah, no, uh, indeed, I'm still looking for a couch. Uh, <laughs> somebody else sitting on my couch and I'm sitting, I'm looking at the closet of uh, somebody else. Yeah, no, I, I think um, what Florian and Gertjan are saying is, uh, is true. There is uh, um, a very likely... Uh, uh, some normalization expected on the supply side on, on some pockets of, uh, of lanes on the air side, uh, transatlantic, Hachan uh, referred to. I think it's important that we 
um, look at uh, certain scenarios because uh, it has been so um, fluctuating uh, recently, uh, unprecedented, as we have said. So there is on the one hand this H2 recovery, but there is also a scenario where the worst is yet to come because uh, we've heard about power cuts, we've heard about uh, Asia, where there's still COVID restrictions in place. And uh, it could very well be that um, that will continue or even uh, aggravates. Yeah? So I think it's important that we uh, understand what the different scenarios are and, 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 and manage our supply chains accordingly. Um, overall, we also believe that um, uh, there will be pockets of recovery, which means that uh, the uh, supply will uh, will return, but demand will um, will still be uh, uh, ahead of supply uh, in in far into 2022. And so demand today is 13 percent over pre-COVID levels, and that will continue to increase for the reasons that we've already discussed. If e-commerce surging, all the port constra uh, constraints on the ocean side stimulates demand for air, air freight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stefan, I want to bring you uh, into the picture uh, being general manager of, of Flexport in Germany. And, and we read a lot about uh, Long Beach, the US, uh, the, the, the Asian situation. Uh, is the worst for European ports still to come? Or uh, are we still doing okay? How would you say uh, are, are Rotterdam, Antwerp, and Hamburg, to name just the three of them, uh, facing the next 12 months? So that's a, that's a very uh, difficult question um, to answer at the moment because everything we see right now, nobody anticipated um, that, it will, um, that it will happen. What we, what we definitely um, see is that the, the whole industry um, was was undergoing a, a you know a, a kind of a, a learning in this in this very difficult situation um, where we had bottlenecks um, all over the place. Um, on the other side, um, it's really um, that we you know we believe that from a from a perspective of you know managing our partners and suppliers um, you know in in the right way and and collaborate more closely with them. If we look at the at the shipment end to end that we are moving, there are sometimes 18 parties involved. So collaboration amongst those is crucial when you have congested um, situations or capacity shortages. Um, third point I would like to raise is um, you know the transparency and visibility that Florian mentioned um, already, which is absolutely um, crucial. Um, I mean, we always need to think about there is somewhere. Um, when we talk about inbound supply chains, for instance, uh, where you have a hundred or thousands of suppliers to manage for an inbound warehouse um, of a factory, um, there's always a bill of material at the end that is required so you can produce and you can run your factory efficiently. Um, so the transparency and visibility about where are my goods, where is the container, um, what kind of exception management can we apply is crucial. Um, it's, it's also about having fixed capacity in place um, to overcome that, capacity agreements in place, going back to the partners. And the last point is probably the most important one, um, that our employees are the biggest asset um, that are taking care of our customers, also in times like these, um, spending long hours. I, I said before, three times more efforts um, to get a shipment moving at the moment. Um, and that's really um, something that we need to all together in the industry um, you know, have to consider. It's the people that are actually um, help to move and keep global, global supply chains moving. If I try to sum up that round, I have to say that the crystal ball remains pretty blurry to me. There are scenarios from A to Z, from very positive to uh, the, the worst is yet to come. Some of, of the aspects already surfaced, uh, what one may be able uh, to do, adapt, being flexible, uh, looking at the technology point of things. Um, I want to take this chance or, or the next round to, to really ask you bluntly, what advice do you give to your customers, Stefan, starting with you? Um, this is clearly an unprecedented situation. Nobody really can predict uh, the near future. Uh, if you had one advice to give, uh, to give to your customers, what would it be? 
So it's it's clearly what we are trying what we are trying to do is to be to be customer centric all the time in everything that we are that we are doing and there is um, clearly the you know with our account managers we we work together with the customer on a day to day basis trying to understand where can we help them um, in moving the cargo how can we um, coach them what kind of uh, consultancy can we provide to them to make sure that you know um, we take the right decisions for them because ultimately it's about like you said it's it's a happy customer we only the the, the only advice we we want to give and can give is you know let's let's work together let's collaborate um, and uh, make sure that you know we have you know through our through our business model with with our platform in place we have transparency um, same transparency like our customers where we where we want them, um, you know, to take decisions with us together and work with us. Um, it's not us or it's not them. It's not, like I said before, the old models do not work anymore um, in times like these. And we also believe moving forward. Um, so we really have, um, you know, to collaborate all together um, to, make this, uh, to make this a success moving forward. Florian, when it comes to, to forecasting and adapting, uh, I, I read uh, the other day, uh, well, if you don't order your Christmas presents now, uh, the chance is very high that you can't get them this year, you'll get them next year. What, what would be your advice uh, uh, to your customer, uh, to your customers uh, on, on how to adapt, what to apply? Uh, in the so for 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 2022, um, I think it's always been uh, important that you're able to forecast uh, what your what your demand is, what your output is going to be in a factory. I think that's become even more more important now. You need to be uh, become better in planning yeah, and to communicate with you with you with you with you with, with all the stakeholders in the supply chain. Um, that means then if you look at your at your at your at your overall freight, uh, there is there's a certain part that is a structural that is very secure that you always always need to ship that you could uh, uh, contract uh, um, in, a, in, in a very solid way with obligations for both parties to, to deliver this freight and also to have the transport capacity. Then on top of that, uh, um, there is like, a, um, um, like some freight that is um, has less volatility you can also contract this one uh, at, at, at different conditions and then the strong volatility like seasonal goods like christmas trees like you mentioned or other things that are, are not structural that are volatile you have to consider to pay spot market prices what these prices will be we don't know at the moment but you have to um, um, you have to anticipate that it's going to fluctuate around the current current levels and that the service levels that we are seeing with like 30 to 40 percent uh, um, 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 only 30 to 40 percent on time performance uh, on average a vessel is 18 days late on a round trip between asia and europe that this will remain remain in place um, so so um, um, forecasting capabilities um, 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 have a try to, to flatten the demand curve try to flatten peaks collaboration with your transport supply Suppliers. And um, like I say, access to visibility is, is, is key with all the lanes, schedule changes. So which goods have been affected? When will they arrive? And and and. Um. Paul, visibility in, in trade lane management uh, key. Anything else uh, that that a customer should look out for? Yeah, no. I think we should always look at challenges uh, in terms of opportunities. And um, what this does is um, it increases the the it has accelerated the need for optimizing the limited space that we have uh, so limited capacity it uh, it has accelerated the need for visibility and transparency as we have uh, heard from stefan and florian and that is what i think customers should also embrace uh, we um, they should look at uh, at their supply chains analyze their supply chains and understand better what is the best modal mix and that has changed today, uh, we know, so there will be more likely a higher percentage of premium services. Uh, but that can fluctuate again when demand or, or supply uh, normalizes. But what it has done structurally, I think, and, and what, what customers, uh, what we see them uh, embracing, what we also encourage, is to be closer in, in analyzing on a detailed level their supply chains and optimizing those supply chains. What we as Flexport do uh, and, and offer uh, our platform offers just that we have um, on one platform we have all the data available uh, we help our customers now to analyze on the SKU level their supply chains and we advise on uh, on the optimal model mix 
Yeah, we, we have we have a few customers, and that's not uh, is not not a new a new product, the Sea Air products. I think we've talked about it already, but we um, we have a few customers that we have that we are now serving with the Sea Air product that they uh, didn't use before. Yeah, good transit times, about 12 days, but much at much better cost than just moving it by air. And that's an example of of the opportunity that that I see also arising from this uh, from this situation. Jan, you, you've been quite uh, flexible and, and adaptive uh, over the last uh, year and a half, uh, as you described. Uh, any message you want to convene to your customers, uh, what, what they should take care of in, in the next year or so? Yeah, I think also, I think, uh, as already mentioned, I think um, uh, our people uh, make a difference. In the end, it's about even stronger communication than we already had finding solutions uh, uh, I think nah, th 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 and that will stay moving forward I think what will be very important is uh, further digitalization yeah, so, so for us that that we really see that as an enablement to basically uh, improve further service that also means uh, we have our my cargo platform uh, where we have an API solution and that makes it possible to create direct connections with our customers which are the forwarders Uh, and by doing that, yeah, then the forwards have direct access to capacity. And, and that means that uh, from a service point of view, they can serve better their customers by having full visibility on the available capacity and prices uh, related to that. And that gives, I think, also in line with what you were saying, that gives the opportunity to better serve, uh, serve customers. So I think moving forward, and that's also what we have been during, uh, doing during the crisis, despite all the financial challenges we had, we have been um, um, uh, investing still in the innovation part. We have been further building our digital offer. And uh, yeah, we, we believe that is key moving forward in terms of... Uh, Of especially in a situation like this. Yeah. So I have to admit, uh, listening to the four of you, uh, I, I grasp that this puzzle piece uh, is not an easy one. You have to take care of a multiple uh, technology, uh, technological uh, points. You need to be adaptive. You need to cooperate uh, with your customers to make the most out of this si challenging situation, which uh, indeed bears some opportunities. Uh, as we're in forward 2021, and we discussed uh, the economic uh, uh, challenges that, uh, that this brings with it, Uh, the, the people aspect has been raised. There is, I believe, one aspect uh, that uh, this situation, together with the techno technological advances that we made, also needs to be addressed. Guess what it is? Sustainability. Uh, Stefan, I know that you have this topic at your heart, uh, and my question would be, is this situation also a chance in terms of reflecting a little bit what we have looking at the technological advances of the visibility uh, methods that your company has also developed in order to say, let's not try to get back to the total normal, but try to get back to a more sustainable, to a more environmentally efficient normal. Uh, isn't that the time to think about that? I think it's non-optional. I think we... Um, we have to we have to step up there, and I, I you know when when we look back the last 12 to 18 months, the whole freight forwarding and logistics industry and everybody working in there somehow received an upgrade, um, you know, from a reputation, from a you know um, um, importance of of the industry, so which was which was very good. At the same time, we also saw bottlenecks and we saw we saw gaps in. Um, innovation in digital transformation, um, in, in mindset, and also in sustainability and environmental aspects. And I think it's it's non-optional in a way that we just have to make it happen. We were one of the of the first companies that made our LCL product carbon neutral um, by offsetting, um, you know, the the CO2 emission that we that we generate. Um, we right now, every shipment that we are moving and the customers are moving with us, you can offset your CO2 emission at a minimum amount, um, which is, um, you know, I, I recently raised, raised the question, what if we make this um, as an opt-out feature rather than, you know, opt-in? And, uh, you know, what would be, how would the customers react um, paying this minimum amount just as a mandatory Um, fee on top of it to offset it. 
So the offsetting is not the final solution. It's just a step um, in the right direction. And it's, it's, it's for us also, um, you know, for, for our customers and all together, you know, leading from the front, making it happen now. But then there is also, I mean, sustainable um, aviation fuel and, and topics like that that need more, definitely more attention, um, more, more, um, more focus in the market um, to have a long term um, goal to really be carbon free and not, um, not, you know, buying your way, um, buying your way out. Kurt Jan, you agree or anything to uh, add on yeah. there? First of all, thanks, uh, Jans, for raising this topic because I think this is indeed, uh, we talk a lot about digital, but I think this is one of the key topics also moving uh, forward. Uh, yeah, as Air France KLM, I think th th this is in our DNA. We have been ranked already for over a decade uh, on the Dow Jones uh, Sustainability Index um, as number one carrier. Um, um, as specifically cargo, we started was it 8 December last year. We started our sustainable aviation uh, fuel program. I think we were the first airline group to do that. And that basically means that we offer our customers, forwarders, the opportunity to procure SAF, uh, which then uh, they can use for kind of reselling. We do that without profit commission. For us, this is really an intrinsic intrinsic uh, move eh, where we basically say we invite all players in the industry to step in um, because we all together need to see how we can uh, reduce the carbon offset of the air freight uh, industry and basically the logistical uh, system. Um, and we basically see that it has a lot of traction at the moment. And so we already signed up ever since um, uh, 25 contracts. I expect that we move to 30 contracts and we have huge requests for next year. So we really see that there's super strong demand and probably you see the same from a Flexport perspective. Huge demand from a shipper perspective. This is really here to stay and this will further grow. So, um, And that is just sustainable aviation fuel, very important uh, for us lever to reduce offsets. But we also in our operations, we do a lot of efforts to uh, further reduce uh, offsets as well by uh, different initiatives. Um, uh, working at this moment at uh, carton beams instead of wood. Eh? Wood mm -hmm. is, of course, it's not that good to use that from an environmental perspective. And uh, and uh, yeah, we expect also to fully uh, implement that uh, very rapidly. So that's just an example. But we have an, uh, a long uh, a long list of activities there uh, to uh, to move ahead. Yeah. Florian, the ocean side of things is uh, is going to be environmentally even more heavily regulated. But any any thoughts? Uh, uh, from your side on this? Yes, so there is going to be a new environmental um, um, regulation called the IMO uh, uh, 23, which basically is related to the, to, to, to the CO2 emission um, uh, um, um, container vessel can have. That, uh, um, that will bring some improvement, but overall, ocean freight today is already the mode of transport with the least CO2 emission by, by, by unit, by transported unit. Eh? So it's, it's, it's by far has the lowest, lowest, lowest output. But I mean, I think the CO2 footprint needs to become a decision criteria. At the moment, we look a lot at offsetting after it has happened. But before the transport, I think the CO2 emission, besides lead time and, and cost, will be a third decision criteria in order to, to manage the supply chain. But if you talk about sustainability, ultimately it means consuming less. Yeah? So, so, so we, we, um, all the, all the, all the, um, all the um, um, measurements in place yeah, bring, bring some improvement, but, but ultimately a society that yeah, um, um, has, has, has a consumption as, as we do uh, and that, uh, um, um, that have, has hundreds of container vessels lying in front of a port, uh, just as bringing co consumer goods, which then are thrown away for, 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 for new stuff, that simply is not a sustainable, sustainable way of, 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 of operating. Yeah? And I think if you talk sustainability, I think the consumption needs to also play a, play a role. Uh, if you, you can offset uh, CO2 emission, you can then find better routings, you can find more efficient ways. But overall, I think that's also an important uh, um, um, puzzle piece uh, in the whole thing. Paul, do you have anything to add in this final round on, on the sustainability and environmental aspect? After these uh, yes. three experts, uh, hardly, hardly uh, anything. I think... Um, I think uh, indeed offset is uh, is great that we offer it and it should be mandatory. Uh, uh, I fully agree with that. But the key is reduction, obviously. Uh, how do we actually reduce? And uh, at Flexport we have created an accredited calculator, CO2 calculator, where you can actually 
calculate the emissions, not only from Flexport shipments, but also from other shipments. Uh, and and uh, so our customers can make informed decisions as where is the least uh, emission. I think that's that's crucial, reduction. And then, as Herjan said, the sustainable aviation fuel programs uh, at, at Flexport, we're looking at working with suppliers, also with Air France KLM, uh, in discussions on the on how we can participate in those soft uh, programs. So yeah, no, uh, uh, very important uh, priority and actually great that this crisis uh, brings it to the forefront because it's uh, crucial. Thank you very much, uh, the four of you. If you read the news, the newspapers, the TV uh, news about the current situation, you gotta have to turn a pessimist, I have to say. But uh, let me tell you, don't do that. Talk to these four gentlemen here and you become an optimist on how this situation can be resolved. I think in the last hour uh, or 45 minutes, we didn't really find that one solution uh, or that one reason that got us into this uh, unprecedented situation. But we've heard a lot of inspirational uh, ideas uh, coming from the digital side, from the collaborative side, from the sustainability side of things uh, that can really uh, make us think a little bit more positive than at the beginning of this uh, conversation about the years or the month and the years to come. So thank you very much, uh, Gerd Jan, Stefan, Florian, Paul. Uh, enjoy the reminder of Forward 2021 and uh, thanks for tuning in and uh, buy your Christmas presents early so that they arrive. Thanks.